Alrighty, so we will go ahead and get started. Um, just as a point of matter, uh, I have slides up here. Um, they have a fairly coherent story with them, but I prefer when people just raise their hands and interrupt me for questions. Um, that gets more value to you guys. Uh, so as we go along, feel free to just interrupt me, raise your hand. Um, I will stop the presentation and we can talk about your question. Um, and so I figured that's a little bit easier, as well as usually when one person has the question, many other people have the same question. Um, so that's how I like to do it. Uh, so as we go along, uh, just starting out, uh, my name's Kyle Den Hartog. Uh, I work at Evernim. Um, uh, I'm also a Hyperledger Indie Ambassador. Um, and so Evernim was the original creators of the Indie code base. Um, and then we donated it to the Sovereign Foundation who ended up donating it to Hyperledger. Um, and so it's gone through a, a few different GitHub repo changes, but uh, the idea is it's all the same. Uh, we've been working on this now for, I believe, two and a half, three years. Um, and so uh, we're in the incubation stage, but it is moving to active status very soon. It's very close. Um, we just have a few more things that we want to do to make it more stable. Um, also, uh, since this is an interactive workshop, I will be working along with this. Uh, basically, I have slides for about 45 minutes-ish uh, to cover the high-level concepts of indie and of agents and things like that. Um, and then we will also link to GitHub repositories so people who have laptops here can actually follow along. Um, and so the idea behind this is that you can actually get yourself started with indie um, and with indie agents on this type of stuff. So I would recommend going to this link uh, because there's other links a part of it as well. Um, they're towards the end. Um, so I'll leave that up there for a second. Welcome. Thank you, guys. So for the, those of you guys just walking in, um, this is a link to the slides. Uh, this is the easiest way. Uh, it's about 45 minutes of like high-level presentation, um, and then we're going to do actual demos, interactive demos, where you guys can participate along with. Uh, so if you guys want to pull those up, uh, if you want to participate, feel free. Um, here's the link to the slides. Um, if other people come in, can you guys please share the link to the slides as well? If they sit down next to you, that'd be awesome. Um, that way I don't have to keep referring back. Uh, What's that? It's under the agenda. So if you go to the agenda, you can click it. Yeah, um, they're slightly different. The ones in the agenda are a PowerPoint copy of this. Uh, the, the exact same slides, but I don't think you can click the links is the only problem. So that's why I link directly to the Google Docs. Uh, but that is a copy for you. But we will go ahead and get started. Um, so yeah, just a little bit about me. Uh, I work on Indie as a core developer, primarily working on agent-to-agent -agent communication, um, doing research in that area to try and figure out how we make this interoperable with many other people, um, and what is an agent, you know, what does it look like, how do you use it, these types of things. And so uh, because these are you know, very new concepts, the, the concept of self-sovereign identity is very new, a lot of this is we're walking through a jungle with machete and just trying to chop our own lane the whole way. So uh, that requires a lot of research and stuff, and so that's largely what I do. Um, there's a uh, connection to two different ways to get a hold of me, uh, Twitter and Hyperledger Chat. Uh, Hyperledger Chat is an awesome way uh, I'm on there quite a bit with an indie. I also tend to look at the general channel and try to help people get to their correct spots and stuff like that. So uh, that's a good place. Feel free to direct message me. Um, the intent of this is that if you guys can't get through it today, uh, you can go back later on, work on this yourself. Uh, and if you have additional questions, you can also uh, message me there. Um, Hopefully, what we do today will actually turn into the getting started guide of Indy in the future. Um, I've been talking with people and they seem thrilled with the idea. So, um, Lastly, I wanted to give a thanks to the Hyperledger staff. Uh, so I actually was not supposed to be giving this talk. Uh, we had to cut a few people and I was supposed to be one of them. So Hyperledger gave me a sponsorship. Uh, they also helped me with these uh, slides. I don't know if you guys have noticed, but everybody's using the same thing. Uh, they basically provided all that marketing and stuff like that. So. Uh, that was very helpful. As well as Tracy Kurt uh, gave very similar talks, and so I borrowed some of her slides, which made this uh, presentation much easier. She is a Hyperledger uh, community architect. Um, so starting out, uh, this is kind of the agenda of how things will go. 
Um, essentially, what we're going to do is we're going to cover some decentralized identity concepts first at a very high level. Uh, then we'll take a look at Hyperledger ND as an architecture. What are all the repos? Um, I don't know if you guys have noticed if you've been in Hyperledger code base, uh, but we have quite a few repos that cover many different areas. Uh, so we'll cover that. Uh, I will show you some high level demo use cases that are in video format um, to give you a concept of how you can sort of uh, leverage uh, self sovereign identity to actually do these things. Um, we'll cover the how to get involved, and then we'll actually go into the interactive demo. Um, and those links are at the very end. So starting out, um, I just wanted to cover kind of the idea of identity models. Um, so this idea around identity models is we've had these for you know very long periods of time. Um, uh, identity has been around for quite some time. It's, it's served purposes. Um, in fact, the one of the earliest national identity systems that existed uh, was created by Napoleon Bonaparte uh, so that he could actually uh, track um, property ownership. Uh, so national identity systems have been around for quite some time. However, they were designed in a very centralized fashion because typically the only people using it were the government to uh, conduct government services. Uh, and so that's kind of the origin of this. And we picked up a lot of those similar thinkings when we started to move into the digital age. Um, so that's how we got uh, similar concepts like HTTPS, SSL, and uh, TLS. This is your traditional client server architecture model. Um, it's where you're looking at things in the way of, I'm trying to go out to a server, and the server owns all the data, stores everything, and I go and interact with it. Um, and so that's kind of the thinking behind that. Um, however, we ran into some problems when we started to do that, and so that's where the creation of what we called federated identity uh, models were. Um, and so the federated identity has been uh, working on similar standards for quite some time now. Uh, so you'll see things like OAuth 2 and OpenID Connect and things like that. That's where you've got basically um, people who can work together. So you could have like your Googles, your Facebooks, all these people getting together in a consortium to actually own uh, you know, one uh, central uh, federated identity uh, server in a way that everybody can go and use and leverage the identity. Um, and so the thinking behind this is uh, you know, now we can start to leverage you know, multiple different uh, people using the identities and we can start to take down some of these silos. However, um, we've seen as we've done a lot of these standards, um, they haven't been as effective as we wanted them to be. Um, they haven't completely torn down uh, identity models, and in some cases, they've actually reinforced them, or uh, identity silos. So for example, when Google became the actual identity provider for everybody else when they uh, use sign in uh, with Google, you're using OAuth 2, um, and now Google basically acts like this giant, giant siloed identity provider for all of these other applications and things like that. Um, and so that's kind of the idea behind uh, identity providers. Um, we've also seen that with these types of models, they create large honeypots, which makes uh, bad, basically, uh, systems around the data models. So for example, uh, we've heard recently about Facebook and Google, who traditionally have had very secure systems, they're still getting hacked. And people are stealing you know, hundreds of thousands of people's data on this and, and mining that data to actually uh, you know, commit identity theft or fraud or extortion or you know, many different scams that come out from this. Um, and so with that, we've been thinking about this. And we thought, what if we could flip this model? What if we didn't need a central person uh, to actually act as the, the central player who stores all our data and stores all these things? What if I could actually store my data? And what if I can set boundaries around what that data actually is and who can have access to it and these types of things? And so that's kind of what the idea behind self-sovereign identity is. Um, it's where I get to control it and I get to interact with who it is. And so this is where you can start to leverage a lot of the peer-to-peer -peer models um, and peer-to-peer -peer co uh, communication protocols that have been de developed um, when we started with uh, you know, the internet in the first place. We didn't traditionally start out with the idea of client-server architectures. We ended up there over time. Um, and so the idea behind self-sovereign identity is we can start to do that. It's just by happenstance that we need a blockchain to be able to do that. Um, 
because there's cases where I need to be globally discoverable. Um, and in the case of global discoverability, while still keeping provenance, a blockchain is awesome to do that. Um, and so that's kind of the idea behind it. The agent-to-agent -agent protocol, and if some of you guys went to Daniel Hardman's talk uh, where it's talking about Microledger, removes the, the blockchain altogether and you go direct peer-to-peer. -peer. Um, and so that's kind of the thinking behind it. The blockchain is there because we need it for certain cases, but in a lot of cases you actually get better privacy um, and better decentralization by just leving, leveraging direct peer-to-peer -peer services um, and the cryptography that have been uh, used for that case. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind self-sovereign identity at a high level and how we ended up on this idea of it. Yeah, go ahead. Why is it called self-sovereign identity, not just sovereign identity? What is this So the idea behind self-sovereign um, is that it's describing, in a way, uh, you as an independent actor are acting in a sovereign way. So if you go look at the definition of sovereign, what it's really doing in many aspects, um, and when we compare it to the analogy of, of governments where the, the word was originally created, it's describing the fact that I get to define and set my own boundaries. Um, and so what we're saying when we're calling it self-sovereign identity is we're saying I as a person get to set these boundaries of how my data interacts with the people that I choose to. Um, and so that's kind of the idea behind it. Thank you again for you know, jumping. Feel free to ask questions as you guys have them. Um, moving forward, though, we'll talk about decentralized identifiers. Uh, so what I want to kind of leverage in this aspect of it uh, is uh, basically how decentralized identifiers work and, and what they're doing. So we'll jump forward. Um, so these are largely based upon similar concepts that came from the URN syntax uh, of uh, basically URIs. So URNs are a form of URIs. Uh, however, URNs specifically specify that you need a URN in front of it as a schema. However, we really like this syntax because what it does is it allows us to basically create a globally unique namespace, but still be able to identify things in a common way and be able to figure out more information about it. Yeah, go ahead. Just, uh, what does URN stand for? URN is Universal Resource Identifier? Yes. The N is... Uh, the N is um, uh, no, no worries. Uh, universal resource name, I think. Uh, I'd have to look it up. That's why IRFC 2141 is in there. Um, I'm not entirely certain. If you figure it out, please shout it out so that everybody else can get that information. Thank you. Okay. Sounds good. So I was, I was close with it. Um, so the idea behind uh, this is that you've got this general scheme, which is describing, uh, you know, what are the, uh, what is this information about? Um, you know, what am I using it for? These types of things. So there's lots of different um, things that follow this URI syntax, um, but URN is describing it. Then we've got the namespace, um, which is describing, you know, here is, uh, you know, where you can leverage this and what are the, the certain properties of it. Uh, and then you've got the actual name-specific identifier. So this is where you create the globally unique identifier to be able to identify, uh, you know, how many ever large space things do some math and get trillions of uh, unique identifiers. So we looked at that and we saw there's a lot of uh, important properties that translate to DIDs. And so that's where we came up with this uh, syntax for DIDs, which is we've got the scheme uh, DID, which is basically describing how you can leverage uh, this identifier and describe the decentralized aspects and certain things with it. Um, and then you've also got the, the method spec. Um, and so this is where the cool areas start to come into play with, uh, with DIDs. Um, so DIDs, uh, the, the method spec, what it's really describing is how can I turn this giant string into the resolving metadata that is actually useful to me. Uh, so for example, keys and, um, uh, what is it, uh, service endpoints are a good example of this metadata. Um, however, when you're using something like Bitcoin, which they actually do have a uh, method spec for, uh, you have to resolve this information in a different way than if you're using something like Sovereign or Indy, which is describing, uh, which has been built around this concept of a DID. Uh, if you guys remember, Bitcoin 
Mine was built way before DIDs were even created. So we're trying to basically take DIDs and put it on top of something where it wasn't designed for that. Indie, however, was designed in that way. So you have different ways that you can actually resolve that metadata uh, associated with the DIDs. Additionally, you, with that, you have this method-specific identifier. So you're getting that globally unique identifier um, in a way that you can identify something using that method spec to be able to identify and resolve this giant string into a piece of metadata. Um, that piece of metadata is something we refer to as a did document. Um, and so the did document, um, I don't think I have an actual slide showing that, but you will be able to see similar information in the interactive demo here. Additionally, you can go take a look at the method specs through the W3C. This is actually a W3C standard uh, that's being worked on. Sorry, it's not an official standard. It's currently being worked on by the community uh, credential group, um, and it's being worked on in collaboration with the next part we'll go to, which is verifiable credentials. Good question? Yeah. Basically, that's introducing another address in right? Yeah. So why not go with the URI system that existed before and use something like web addresses or something? Um, so I'm not... Uh, probably the best person, actually the best person is Drummond, or Phil might be able to help out with this one, uh, to answer that, because I wasn't around when they when they originated it. Um, my thinking of it is, though, that your eyes and the namespaces that were currently out there didn't cover all the properties we needed. Uh, so specifically, the properties we were looking for um, was we wanted globally unique, we wanted cryptographically verifiable, uh, we wanted uh, decentralized, um, and there's a fourth property, which I'm not remembering right now. Now. Um, but the idea was we couldn't find any uh, namespace uh, which had all of those properties with it, and so we needed to go create one. But we wanted to leverage some of the ideas that were already created before, which is why we built it off your eyes. Yeah, go ahead. Short comment, the only thing that I didn't really get is why you weren't using a stock namespace of your rights. But well, that, that's to be discussed. Because you started like with the new top level namespace, so you could have yeah, it's it, it's one of those things where these are how standards typically emerge. Uh, you know, it's do I want to put something at the same space as the URN or do I want to put under it? Um, a lot of the original architects who came up with these ideas are the people making these decisions. And like me, I came along um, about a year and a half ago when this work has been going on since about 2014. So I can't give you all the, uh, as I like to refer to it, tribal knowledge of what occurred, uh, but I can give you uh, how it's useful um, and how you guys can use it. Uh, yeah, no problem. Uh, so what's interesting about uh, Sovereign and, and a large portion of the self-sovereign identity space now um, is that DIDs are not just one single identifier. Um, DIDs are something which will be contextually unique um, and you will have basically pseudonyms for many different relationships. Um, so that's kind of the idea behind a DID is it's representing like a relationship. Um, and what I mean by that is like the connection between two independent entities. So a relationship doesn't have to exist exist between um, you know, my, you know, me as a person to another person. It can exist between me and an IoT device, or even an organization and an organization, or an IoT device to another IoT device. Um, and so what these DIDs are meant to represent is uh, you know, that relationship. But what we realize is that that basically gives away a lot of correlating properties with it. And so that's where we came up with this idea of contextually unique. Um, this is also referred to as a pairwise identifier. Um, and so the idea behind it is that you can have an identifier to identify and control your correlation levels with other people. Um, and so we didn't want the identifier itself to become the basically global cookie of the entire space, which allows you to be identified by any person. Um, and so this is where that became like very very useful. And since we had you know this giant trillion uh, number namespace, we were able to do this. Um, so to give you a little context of what this really means. 
uh, essentially, I could have a DID for each individual in this room, and I could control the amount of information that I share with you guys each individually. Or I can choose to publish a single DID up here, and you guys could all connect to me and identify me in that way. And then you could all go behind, uh, you know, behind my back without my boundaries that I've set, and you could actually choose to correlate information together. Um, and so this is where the idea of I get to control it and set that boundary. Um, if I choose to share the same identifier with every single person in here, then I'm choosing to accept the risk that you guys can correlate certain information based upon this inf identifier. Um, and so this is where it's very nice to be able to have uh, contextually unique identifiers for each individual person if you choose. Moving forward, we've got this concept of verifiable credentials. Um, essentially what a verifiable credential is, is it's data that's signed. Um, that's the simplest way to put it. Um, it. It can be used and it's often looked at in a way where it's high trust data, but it doesn't have to be high trust data. Uh, so for example, a driver's license is a perfect example of a high trust data. I want to make sure this person is actually issued a, a driver's license by the government, not by just some random person off the street who's making fake IDs. Um, and so this is where the signing of that data is actually very valuable. Because uh, traditionally we've signed data, but that signature and that key hasn't been able to be identified to any trusted source. Um, and so with this, uh, in the combination of DIDs and verifiable credentials, we can now start to identify the provenance of that key and be able to identify the source of the data who's actually attesting that this is true. What this does is it allows us to leverage a lot of cool properties with that. Similarly, since we're doing signatures and we're using cryptography, we can do a lot of other cool stuff as well. So, we'll talk about kind of what the idea of today's credential workflow is um, as it exists right now. So the idea behind this, um, and what most people do is pull out the driver's license, so I'm getting that out. Uh, I'm issued a credential. So for example, using this driver's license here, um, the uh, Department of Transportation, or whoever issues these, these IDs, essentially issues this to me, prints the, the plastic card, you know, puts their, their cryptographic ink and stuff like that on here, um, and then they actually give it to me. So anytime I go use this card, um, say for example, if I'm at voter registration, um, the Department of Transportation does not actually know that I'm using it because it's a physical entity. They have no way of tracking it. However, in the digital world, we never really had that great of idea, uh, never really had that great of way to do this exact same model, which is why we traditionally had people setting up public APIs where I could say, hey, if you want that data, go contact them. And so they would go get that data from the other person and they hold that data. That's the only way that we could get that provenance of that data. Um, but that doesn't really map very well. It, it, there's kind of this discontinuum between the physical world and the digital world. So, similarly as well, when I go present this credential and I take this, uh, you know, to the voter registration to prove, you know, here's my address and here's, you know, something, somebody else has already checked all this information and give this to me, I can go give that to them so that they don't have to verify all that data themselves. They can go, I trust that the, this ID was created by somebody that I know spent a good amount of time verifying this data, so I don't need to go re-verify this myself. This is an aggregate of data, essentially, and it's been verified by the Department of Transportation, which is essentially the government. Um, and so that's what makes it very easy to present these credentials. So this is what they're doing when they're validating their credential integrity. So essentially what they're doing is they're looking at the ink and they're going, yeah, that ink doesn't look like it's been faked. Um, you know, there's some, some good, uh, uh, what is it, fake ID creators in, uh, that can create these things. But at the same time, they aren't perfect. Unless the person has direct access to the same person who's creating it, they're not perfect. And what's even better, when we're working in the digital space, we can rely on the mathematics to show that it's not perfect. Um, and so this is where, in a digital space, when we're using verifiable credentials, we can actually do better than the physical space in many aspects. Better? You're getting in the way between college kids and the <laughs> That's, uh, there will, they will still find a way. It's one of those things where people always seem to. 
Um, and so the idea behind this is using the blockchain, we can now do similar properties. Um, so oftentimes, these credentials, the person who's signing these credentials needs to be globally uh, identifiable. Um, so the Department of Transportation needs to be globally identifiable, and that's where the blockchain comes into play. It's very useful to be able to discover their keys. So what you'll notice is that we have a slight change in how we issue credentials now. So what we do is we actually register basically proof of a credential integrity and provenance uh, to the actual blockchain. What that means is we're basically taking the same schema as what's on here. So right now it's got you know my name, my address, uh, driver's license number, which is contextual to you know the driver's license association. Uh, there's an issuance date, you know all these forms of uh, attributes of data on here, and we're registering registering what are the fields of attributes. We're not registering the actual data itself. The data does not go on the ledger, rather the fields themselves do. And then additionally with that, we're going to then take keys and we're going to say, uh, if I'm the Department of Transportation and I'm issuing, I'm going to take my key and I'm going to sign that schema and I'm going to put that signed schema on the ledger, which is basically, I'm taking those fields and signing it and saying, I will actually issue this credential. Um, and that's how we can actually identify and link the credential or the DID to the schema itself to say, here, who's, here is who's going to be issuing it um, in a way that's globally recognizable that creates the provenance and the integrity when I go to check the signatures. The idea, the idea that every issuer will have their own, uh, their own schema, or is there an idea of standardization so that driver's licenses are easily comparable independent of who issued them? Yes, so w w our intention is that uh, basically standardization will occur around this. Um, and some of the discussions that were just happening right next door that I just came from, we're talking about how we can actually uh, formulate this in a way that makes it easier to standardize it. Um, so one of the thinking is, if there's a standard approach to an address, um, we can standardize that address itself and the schema of that address into its own individual credential and combine that into other schemas. Um, and so you create this ontological order um, of how the actual schemas are created and hopefully don't have you know, this uh, basically silo of schemas where people can't talk to each other because additionally what that creates is a, a form of correlation. If somebody's issuing a credential and they're the only person who issues it, then you can actually identify you know, the location and who they're interacting with because they have that credential and they're using that credential uh, definition even though you use selective uh, disclosure. Um, so that's kind of more the zero knowledge uh, aspects which we'll show in the demo. Um, but jumping back to this, when I get this credential issued to me, essentially what they're doing is they're signing data. Um, and they're doing it in a zero-knowledge way uh, so that um, basically they're verifying it, but they're providing me with ways that I can go take that data later on and go prove it to somebody else. Um, and what that does is it allows for me to choose how I'm disclosing that data, which gives better properties than what happens in the phys physical world again. Because right now, when I go hand this driver's license to somebody, and they need to know that I'm over 18 to vote, they also get to see my address, my name, and all this other information that they may not necessarily need. Um, and so this is where selective disclosure um, and these zero knowledge proofs come into play to actually help with this. So this is kind of the idea behind the uh, presentation of the credential. I can now start to choose which data I'm disclosing to people, which becomes very helpful to me to uh, have a little bit of control in the negotiation of which data I give up. Nowadays, if I want to go log into a service, they just put like a little red asterisk next to it and I can't even sign up for the service unless I provide them with all the data. Now in this world, they can still do that, but I can have negotiation leverage and it's much easier to be able to conduct this in a way that the business may be able to set up terms of service that say, if you provide us with this name, then we'll give you this service, but if you give us the name and the address, we'll give you this other service as well. Um, and so it allows for these uh, different sites, uh, types of uh, terms of services to come about where you can have different consents um, and you're basically consenting to it when you share that data. Um, and so that's one of the idea behind that um, and one of the cool properties of uh, self sovereign identity. It makes it more difficult though to enter fake data, right? Yes. So right now you can give wrong birth dates, and I 
I guess we all do that all the time. Yep. And that will be infinitely difficult with the system. Yeah. Within the system itself, they can actually restrict it to say, not only do I need you know that attribute, but I can specify who I want to have signed that data from before. So they can say, not only do I need your birthday, but I need proof that the government actually said that that's your birthday, not just you self-attesting it. There is also the option to create self-attested credentials um, to be able to actually just state it, but you know that's it's the the leverage and the basically the spectrum that you can create that creates that leverage where you can now start to negotiate. So lastly, in this new process, you've got this validation of credential integrity and provenance. Yeah, go ahead. So it, they will still have leverage, but what it's doing is it's coming closer to the equalization. Right now it's an all or nothing binary kind of option. What this service allows is for, you can basically turn it from this binary option to basically a spectrum of options. So if they want to offer you services, let's, let's look at this in a, a real world example. So say for example they're offering a service where they're having a tiered approach. They can say, I will offer you the free service if you give me all of your data. Or I will give you, uh, you know, the, the partial approach if you only give me partial, uh, partial amounts of your data. Um, and I will give you, if you pay for all, I don't even request any data. You just need to prove that you have the data. Um, and so what that does is it creates opportunities for tiering, which actually increases the economic benefits to the business because they can now choose whether or not they would rather have money up front or they would have data which they're going to leverage later on. One thing that you've noticed is that originally when they started coming out, uh, they actually did it in that way where it's like, I'm just not even going to install it unless you accept it. One thing that you can actually do nowadays with these apps is they will give you service. This model actually already exists because they want to be on your phone and they want your attention, so they're actually going to, to still put it on there. But what they've done is they figured out, do I actually need that camera permission right now? So it is possible to turn off your camera permission um, and then turn it on when you actually need the service. Uh, that's an example of something that we actually do uh, in the application of the company that we build. You can actually say, hey, I don't want you to have camera permissions right now, but as soon as I want to go connect with somebody and use the QR code section of the app, I need to turn that camera on and give that permission. But as soon as I'm done with that service, I can turn that off. Um, and so you can do the same thing with data. So it's hard to say, but it's the opportunity, I, I would say, is the, the largest point, and we're, we're basically granting that to exist. Yeah, go ahead. I think what you're saying is, is a very good concern and very valid. I mean, like, economic pressures will, the, no, you have to consider them. Uh, one, one answer to that is GDPR. GDPR is listening to states, you can't force people to give data if it's not necessary for a service. Like, that, that's it. So that's illegal in Europe right now to do that. So it's not enforced fully. That's sort of the idea. Uh, and the other thing is probably collective bargaining, which is, uh, we'll get to it later, but this is an answer I got the other day, so I'm just, just repeating it. Um, the agent itself that acts on behalf of the users, if enough users use a special type of agent that is very protective of the privacy, you might know that if you do this, you're going to lose, I don't know, 50 million people who use this agent who will not allow it. So if people are collective enough when they're using an agent, and the agent enforces certain things that we don't give away a data birth, then maybe the service provider will think, hmm, if I do that, I will lose all the users of, you know, like the browser Firefox is now much more aggressive on privacy, 
So when you do certain things, you know, you might lose some of the use of those using some type of, of way of looking at it. Perfect. And that's exactly the type of things that I want. Uh, this is not me standing up here and just, you know, professing the world of indie to you guys. Uh, this is a community discussion. Um, I, I find that much easier to talk, uh, as well as I find most people uh, leave with much more information. Um, I did see you have a question, though. Yes, yes, so this is uh, one of the pieces of data that actually does exist, but it's a piece of data that exists as metadata that is non-identifiable to any person. Uh, Can you repeat the question? Oh, yes, uh, so he asks, is there a way to be able to revoke credentials similarly, similarly to what I can do with um, a driver's license today? Um, and so the answer to that is yes, this is possible. Um, and the way we do that is we use the blockchain to actually register that information. Um, so the, uh, I suppose this is a good time to cover, you know, what is the actual information that exists on the ledger. So we've already established that there's schemas and schema identifications. Uh, so schema IDs is what we refer to them. Uh, there's credential definitions and credential definition IDs. Um, and then there's uh, DIDs themselves which uh, more than likely is only going to be issuers in the future. Uh, that's likely because of uh, GDPR compliance as well as scalability concerns. Um, and then the last piece uh, right now is revocation registries and a fifth piece that will exist in the future uh, is going to be agent authorization policies, which is basically how I can revoke an agent who has all of the information. Uh, essentially, if I left my, my phone you know, on the backseat of a taxi or something, um, I can actually take that uh, phone and I can say, even though it has all the information to go and prove that uh, it has the credential, it can't actually do it uh, because it's been revoked. Um, and so that's kind of one of the concepts behind the agent authorization policy. Um, and so you've got those five pieces of things that exist on the ledger, um, and they're done in a way which is non-correlatable, um, which is the most important part. Uh, essentially how that's done is we have what's referred to as a cryptographic accumulator, which just takes a, a randomly identifiable number, um, and you use that number when you're issuing the credential, uh, as the issuer, and then the issuer can go in and pull that number out of the blockchain because they're the one who controls it, which then means that the person, when they're going to prove it, can't prove that that number exists in that cryptographic registry anymore. Um, and so that's where credential, uh, when you prove a credential, what you're actually doing is you're proving the data itself, but you're also proving non-revocation. So you're essentially saying, I can prove that this hasn't been revoked. Um, rather than uh, proving that uh, it's been revoked or something like that, or the person having to go scan the whole chain to, to check that. Yeah, go ahead. In the case of, say, a uh, uh, pop shop or liquor store checking your ID, when you present the credentials, that liquor store will still have your name, presumably your photo, and your date of birth. If they request it and if you choose to give it to them. So we have the capabilities to actually say, you don't even need that. You just need to know that you know, the, the government has issued it um, and that I have a driver's license that proves that I'm over 21. And that's actually the perfect segue to zero knowledge proofs. But yeah, you got another In question. That case, um, the schema that was registered on the blockchain registry doesn't contain a field to say, is this person able to buy liquor? Uh, it just has their date of birth. So who is doing the, the transposition of the data into that verifiable file? The uh, uh, prover themselves is taking the data. Um, so the prover is the holder as well. So that means me. Um, my, uh, and, and not physically me, I'm not sitting down doing some math for them. My phone is, and that's where an agent comes into play. Um, uh, but the idea behind it is it's taking uh, the, the data that was issued to me um, and it's transforming it into a zero knowledge proof um, in such a way that I can go prove certain uh, aspects about that data. Um, so I can prove I have some credential, I can prove, uh, you know, with numbers I can actually prove greater than, uh, less than, or equal values, which is where uh, that example comes into play. Um, and you can do lots of other types of things that we've been looking at as well. 
Um, and so this is where you kind of need that issuance uh, aspect of it to also create that proving aspect. Uh, so you're doing uh, commitment proofs at the beginning when you're issuing, where you're actually passing blinded uh, attributes uh, that are uh, attributes of encoding. So typically what that means is I'm taking the string, hashing it um, as an encoding form, um, and then I'm blinding that giant number, and then I can prove that I have an attribute that's been signed by them without having to actually reveal that attribute. Um, so that kind of dips into the idea of zero-knowledge proofs. Uh, so this is a definition of kind of what a zero-knowledge proof is, uh, and it came from this link that's provided here, and these are the authors. Um, this is one of Tracy's slides uh, that I borrowed. So um, basically what it is, is a high level of explaining what it is. A zero-knowledge proof is a method by which one party, the prover, can prove to another party, the verifier, that something is true without revealing any information apart from the fact that this specific statement is true. So we can reveal information about information using zero-knowledge proofs is kind of the idea behind it. So I can reveal I'm over 21 without revealing my actual date of birth. And that's the thinking behind this. So uh, this is the exact example. I, I jumped ahead past the slide. Now you have these new capabilities. Um, you know, when I go to the bar, I don't have to show them my driver's license. That bouncer doesn't have to get the information about this who can then take that and go to the address and, and do some sort of creepy thing with it because he doesn't even get access to the information in the first place. Uh, so this allows for your, you know, your new privacy aspects to come into play. Um, and this is where the creativity of zero-knowledge proofs comes into it. However, there is a caveat to zero-knowledge proofs. Um, and this is something that I like to point out. Um, if you think about the game 20 questions, 20 questions is essentially a zero knowledge proof game. Um, and so the idea behind it is in each question that I'm asking and getting a yes, no answer back, I am asking a question and, and trusting the person who's giving the response um, that they are responding in zero knowledge, yes or no. If I get enough yes, no questions to occur, I can start to guess the actual information itself. Um, and so that's an important caveat. But the awesome part about this is that the, the person who has the information, um, typically the holder, which the information is about, can choose, I'm no longer going to answer the questions. So let's think about it this way. What if I'm playing uh, you know, 20 questions with a person and they choose as the, the responder, after one question they're going, I don't feel like playing this game anymore. They can just give up and no longer reveal any information. Um, now, if there's stakes on the game and stuff like that, you know, things change, but you know, that's kind of the, the caveat to this, to, to bring about the idea that um, you know, zero-knowledge proofs are not the silver bullet to privacy. They just help enable it. So, additionally, this is where we get into the idea of decentralized key management. In other words, agents. Because um, I don't manage keys myself, that would be very messy. Um, similarly to the janitor who after 20 years figures out the giant key ring, which key goes to what door. Um, and so that's kind of the idea behind agents. So we'll start out with a definition of agents to kind of demystify it. So this is something that we thought about this morning um, in order to, to help uh, basically define these things in a better way. Uh, but it's not a set definition of agents because we are just still creating these in many ways. Um, so the definition, I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it for you. Uh, an agent is a piece of software which is authorized by an entity, so that could be a person, IoT, device, organization, something, basically a noun is how I like to think about it, to speak or listen SSI protocols on the behalf. So let's break this, this down. What this basically means is any piece of software can be an agent. You don't have to you know, have this defined agent, uh, this, this thing that only speaks SSI protocols. That's how some people have come to the community thinking about an agent in many aspects. Um, but an agent is really just any piece of software that can speak specific protocols. Um, and one of the uh, ideas behind this is that this is what allows for the creativity and the extensibility of this. Um, however, there's a, a few things that, that are kind of the gotchas. So one of the examples that we talked about today is uh, when a bank is talking with the Federal Reserve, they're not speaking SSI. Um, and that's because they've defined certain protocols that have to occur at a, uh, you know, a certain governmental level of which um, you, know, you can't set the boundaries. 
um, in order to, to choose how to play. And SSI, that's one of the things that we, we find very valuable. Um, the other one, uh, the other example is preventing impersonation. Um, and so one of the things that you do to prevent impersonation as well as to prevent uh, correlation of information is use cryptographic keys. And that's how we ended up on this giant messy problem of decentralized key management. Um, key management is hard as it goes. When you decentralize it, you make it even harder. And so that's kind of the idea behind uh, what an agent is at a very high level. Similarly, we have agents that exist in the world today. My lawyer acts on behalf of me when I go to court in order to speak court language. I don't know how to, when is the right time to object. Uh, object. I don't know, you know how to use case law in order to do certain things. So the lawyer acts on my behalf in my best interest to represent me to the court. Um, if I knew how to represent myself to the court, I could do that. Similarly, if I knew how to specifically speak SSI protocols, I could also do that. In the example of Dar Daniel Hardman yesterday where he was using the mail agent, he as a person was actually typing in, he actually copied and pasted because he defined it, but he defined the SSI protocol which is the JSON object that has to be communicated. However, for a mainstream audience to use this stuff, we can't expect that they're gonna be able to speak it, but if you want to, you can. Um, and if you're developing the protocols, you're likely going to need to so that you can develop what they look like. Um, and so that's kind of the idea behind it. So additionally, agents, uh, as, as the, uh, the example goes, agents act like your own personal Jarvis. Um, so if you guys remember Jarvis from, uh, from Iron Man, uh, Jarvis was the person uh, that acts like Siri and, and Cortana and uh, uh, Alexa to basically respond to information on behalf uh, of me. However, um, you know, in those examples, uh, they're doing it, Jarvis is, is not, which is why it's kind of the premier example of this. Uh, Jarvis is acting on your behalf, um, but if you think about it in terms of Siri or Alexa, we can be fairly certain that they're actually not acting on behalf of um, Amazon or the company that owns them and developed the protocols in a proprietary way. They're still speaking some protocol, but I don't know how Alexa is communicating to Amazon um, unless I go dig into you know, traffic analysis and these types of things and look at the information. Um, and in some cases, they're actually uh, grabbing information that I don't know about. In the SSI world, that's very important. The user needs to know and consent to the things of which they're sharing. And you should be developing your protocols and your agents in a way that allows for this to occur. So this means, we're not trying to trick people into you know, terms of service agreements by getting them to just check through the box. One thing I was discussing that I want our company to do is to very clearly state what is the information that we have. Even if it's encrypted, we're going to state, you know, like, and I'm not making this as how it's going to be, but what I would like to see us do is if we are encrypting metadata about you, we will tell you which data we are uh, encrypting and what that metadata is. We will do it in a way which is easy to understand for the general mainstream audience, uh, but that's kind of the thinking behind this is users need to be able to develop the autonomy to be able to make decisions. And we've got to help them as developers do that. Um, that's how we ended up on the path where all of this data was being gobbled up was because users didn't understand what was being gobbled up. They didn't understand the value to it. Um, and we ended up in, in places which created the world that we have today. So agents also allow for diffuse trust of keys. Um, essentially what this means is I'm not only going to have one agent representing me. Right now I have two that would be representing me. I have a phone and I have a laptop and they both need to be able to communicate together. I don't know if you guys have used uh, something like Signal before, uh, but uh, a lot of in, in encryption schemes have a terrible time being able to actually perform these aspects. One thing that we're defining when, in defining the underlying agent-to-agent -agent protocol is how we can actually perform routing of messages to multiple devices that represent me in a very easy way without having to do all these setup features and these types of things. Um, and the way that we're doing that is by using uh, a different uh, set of agents in order to, to help out with these types of things. But different agents also have different levels of trust. Um, and this is where the diffused trust of keys comes from. So as a person, I can choose uh, you know, that 
this laptop here moves with me quite a bit. My phone moves me, with me even more. So I may choose that I trust and I want more information to exist on my desktop computer at home, which never moves, um, than I do from my laptop or from my phone. And what that allows me to do is to be able to say, that desktop computer at home, which sits there, can deactivate these devices by going out to my uh, out to the indie ledger and saying, deauthorize them using that agent authorization policy. And so that's kind of the concept behind this. And additionally with that, I could take, you know, uh, I could hand out a recovery key, um, which is where uh, the DKMS documents come into play, um, which is basically using traditional cryptography that we've had for a while, Shamir secret sharing, um, packaging, packaging it up in a nice UI layer um, and distributing those out so I can hand out a key to every single person in this room and say, I only want 50, 50 of you to uh, be able, if 50 of you to get together and aggregate them all, um, then I can recover my data. Now, people in this room probably wouldn't be the best example, but what would be a good example is maybe my lawyers, maybe my friends, maybe my family, people who I can trust that have this information in order to actually, I, I can go back to them by remembering those relationships in the first place who I chose and I trusted, to be able to go back and get that information in a nice fancy UI layer to be able to recover all my information and decrypt it again. That's how you prevent uh, basically uh, identity being lost um, and recovery of identity in a decentralized way. That's kind of the thinking. Yeah, go ahead. So uh, biometric is, is still a perfect example and it's still usable within the system. However, one thing about the, the biometrics um, is that they're impersonatable. Uh, biometrics are also not a good example of where you derive your keys from. For example, if somebody has access to my actual fingerprint, they can impersonate me forever. I can't just go change my, my fingerprint. Um, however, I can change a key. And with the usage of DIDs, I can change my key and still have a persistent identifier because the identifier itself has been decoupled from the key, uh, which is one of the, the cool aspects of those decentralized identifiers. However, uh, from a practical standpoint, biometrics are awesome. Um, you know, like it, on my phone, where I protect my phone and it's in my pocket most of the time, I don't need the threat model of, you know, the Department of Defense where they need three factors of authentication or something like that. So I can have, you know, a biometric to unlock my phone, which is really technically two factors of authentication. I need the device itself and I need the actual fingerprint to unlock the device. And then with that, I can decrypt all of the keys that exist on my agent to actually communicate. Um, and so kind of, that's the kind of thinking behind it. Um, so you can do that similarly with uh, you know, FIDO and other types of uh, authorization policies to actually access uh, my device today. Um, and so that's kind of the thinking behind it. Does that cover your question? Perfect. So similarly, as I was describing, um, agents allow for diffuse trust. So this is essentially that agent authorization policy in uh, slide form. I didn't realize I had that in there. So um, additionally, we're going to show kind of the, the social recovery aspect. Um, so if I've got five friends and I hand them a, a, a set of keys, I may be able to assign when I set this up, I want three of my friends to give me back their, their portion of the key so that I can reassemble that key and be able to identify it. Um, that's using polynomial interpretation or interpolation. Um, so a fancy word of saying, uh, how do I figure out the B and the Y equals MXB formula when I've only got a single X point? Um, and so it's, it's a bunch of fancy math that's been developed and, and proven in a paper, um, and it works. And so that's the, the simplest aspect about it. Um, to that point, though, if only two of them exist, the math proves that you can't recombine it and figure out what is the Y coordinate of it. Um, and so that's what allows us to be able to prevent that key. Because essentially everything when we're saying keys and all of these representations and stuff, most of it boils down to a, a bunch of numbers. And because it's a bunch of numbers, we can perform these cryptographic functions on it. It's just a bunch of fancy math in order to actually get these cool real world value use cases. So uh, as I like to, 
think back, all those friends who are saying, when am I actually going to use algebra? You use it here. So moving on, uh, we are now to the second part of the agenda. Let me do a time check real quick. We're at 3.15. OK, this has gone a little longer. Uh, we got to the, the fast parts of it. Uh, or we're getting to the faster parts now uh, with the Indy architecture. So what is actually exists in Indy? Right now, we've got the, uh, the crypto repository. Um, and essentially what the crypto repository is, it's currently used uh, by Hyperledger ND for ZK proofs and our signed state proofs. Um, essentially what that means is we've decoupled our cryptography out to a separate repository um, and we're actually combining it with Hyperledger Ursa. So you heard a lot of those things. A large portion of what Hyperledger Ursa is right now is taking a lot of the indie crypto code and some of the uh, um, sawtooth code and some of the fabric code and it's combining that all together. Um, and so we've got engineers at the Sovereign Foundation um, who are actually working to contribute that code and, and merge it all together. So uh, what we're working on right now um, is actually taking the Ursa code and putting that back into Indy um, rather than having a dependency on Indy Crypto itself. Um, and so that allows for a lot of the um, aspects of what is going into Indy Crypto in the future to be extensible to the Indy project as well later on. Um, it also includes CL signatures, which is the actual signature scheme that we use uh, to do the zero knowledge proofs of credentials. Uh, this is the underlying aspect of IDEMIX. Um, and this was created by Jan Kamenisch, who has been helping with uh, URSA itself. Um, so the implementation is considered secure by the person who created the protocol. Um, and so that's the nice thing about the URSA project in general is that uh, you know, we've got you know, world-class world -class cryptographers who are in cr creating these protocols actually showing up and helping with the implementations. Um, additionally, we use BLS signatures for the nodes to communicate um, uh, verification of transactions. Um, and so with that, we put that in the ND crypto layer as well. Moving forward, we've got the uh, plenum consensus. Uh, so this is Hyperledger ND plenum. Um, it's uh, a protocol that was developed for Hyperledger Indy. It's based on an RBFT protocol. Um, it's leader based, but it has redundancies in it, which is why it's RBFT. Uh, so RBFT stands for Redundant uh, Byzantine Fault Tolerant Protocol. Um, and so this plenum protocol takes a large portion of what was defined in RBFT um, and defines a few other things that weren't defined very well in the paper um, so that we can have a, a protocol for consensus. Um, it's also designed in such a way that it's extensible. So similarly to Sawtooth, if any, guys, any of you guys have worked on that, Sawtooth has pluggable uh, consensus algorithms. Um, we wanted to design some more functionality to that. There's a strong dependency in the node right now on Plenum, uh, but the idea is that you could actually plug in different consensus algorithms, which is why they were decoupled in separate repositories. Um, additionally, uh, it can sustain F failures. So this is the mathematical property of the Byzantine fault tolerance. Essentially what that means is you need 66.6% success rate in order to uh, actually reach consensus. So uh, the, the example here is if I've got uh, four failures um, and I want to have a 13 nodes, uh, I can uh, sustain four failures essentially. Um, those failures could be um, you know, hacking, it could be, you know, the node just was turned off or something like that and hasn't communicated to it. It, it can be basically anything. Um, and so that's kind of the idea behind it. It's, it's plenum, I mean, so you basically have your own uh, blockchain, which is plenum, is that right? Um, in a sense, yes. Uh, plenum runs the verification of things. Um, and it has built into it the NIM processing. Uh, NIMs are essentially DIDs. Uh, it's how we refer to the transaction. Uh, but uh, the scheme IDs and the credential definition IDs actually fall in the node repository. So yes, it has its own blockchain. Um, it has its own hash link to us, essentially, um, with the consensus protocol added on top. Does that make sense? OK. Um, so the thinking behind it was we needed certain properties. Um, I don't know the properties well enough to say exactly what they are. Uh, I know the most important one that we considered, which is why we moved away from uh, permissionless uh, 
consensus protocols was we needed finality. Um, and that's typically why you end up in permissioned consensus algorithms in the first place. Um, it, it's one of the reasons at least, and it was our driving reason. Um, there's also other properties that we needed um, that were gained in this way using RBFT. Um, but the problem was, as I said, the RBFT protocol doesn't de describe how you do view change. Um, what that means is when you've got less than certain nodes or when your leader is acting potentially maliciously or slow, how do you change leaders? Um, and so that's what we had to go and define, and that's typically the difference between them. Yeah, go ahead. I was going to remark that um, one practical reason that it doesn't use Fabric is because um, Indy came along after Fabric and Plenum already existed, and there, <coughs> there have been several proposals to trade it out for other things, not just Hyperledger things, but other things. Um, it's always not been um, compelling enough to go through the work to do it, but it certainly could be in the future. There's, there's nothing about the upper layer, layers that are tied to a particular consensus algorithm. So if, if it made sense to do it, it could happen. But right now, it's not any, on anyone's burning list of priorities. Yep. And along with that, uh, we have started to consider other consensus algorithms. Um, there's no certainty that we'll switch or anything like that. There's no timeline for it, but we're starting to consider it. Uh, we started to look at Tendermint and things like this uh, to use uh, you know, other protocols as well and to be able to adapt to you know, those communities um, and have uh, collaboration between them um, so that you can have you know, those, uh, similarly to what you have with cryptography where they say don't rule your own cryptography, you get the same ideas in distributed systems where they say don't create your own consensus protocols. Turns out we had connections to a guy who has a PhD in distributed systems, so that helps. Um, so moving on to the uh, any node, uh, this is where you're processing a lot of the transactions. So the node is acting, uh, it, as someone pointed out to me recently, it is acting as an agent for the entire uh, uh, consensus. Um, and the ledger itself is also an agent, which was just kind of a mind-blowing experience. Um, basically, the ledger itself is an agent and representation of the entire community. Um, and it's acting on behalf of the entire community. So the community itself can be an entity because it's an organization. Um, and so that's kind of some, some cool thinking that we've been playing around with um, to think, how can we leverage agent-to-agent -agent protocol to actually communicate to the ledger directly? Um, so you're, you're basically, your node is a reference agent um, that also speaks a consensus protocol because a protocol, a, a consensus protocol is still just a protocol. Um, and so that's kind of the idea behind it. Um, uh, one of the things that the node does is it actually performs the validation checks, um, which basically means, is the, is the transaction properly formatted? Is it signed properly? Um, you know, does this information make sense? Does it you know, meet all the contextual needs that we need to put it on the ledger and achieve consensus? If it does, it goes on the ledger. Um, and like I said, it wraps the plenum protocol, and as Phil pointed out, it doesn't have to be the, the plenum protocol. Um, there's nothing uh, within identity itself that says we have to build um, based upon these things, but based upon the properties we wanted, this one made the most sense. So moving forward. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Just to make sure I'm following. So, so the, the nodes make up the network that agree on the new ledger state? Yeah. Does that mean that every user have to, has to run their own node, or how is that relationship working? Uh, so the user does not have to run their own node. So as a part of the plenum consensus, since we're using BLS signatures, we actually get this property uh, that we have called state proofs. So because we have that finality, what you can actually do is you can prove the state of the ledger without having a copy of the ledger itself. Um, and that's a, that's a very awesome property for the scalability uh, because what that essentially means is I can have all of these light clients. 
If Bitcoin had these types of things built into it, you wouldn't have to run your own node, and you could still technically be decentralized. Now, there's some people within the uh, cryptocurrency community and stuff like that, and other aspects of the, the blockchain community who don't consider that purist decentralization, but this is also why I say the word decentralization isn't the greatest word because it's been watered down with so many different meanings. So whenever somebody uses that word with me, I ask them, can you define what it means to you? Um, so who would run the node in a typical scenario if it's not every user? Um, so in the case of the sovereign network, uh, 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 who runs the node uh, typically? And actually, do you want to answer this one? This one's perfect for you. <laughs> yeah, so um, as, as Kyle mentioned, uh, the ledger is permissioned, and uh, we consider it a public permission ledger, meaning that it's hybrid. What I mean by public permission is we split transactions into the action of authoring the transaction and verifying the transaction. So authoring transactions is public, but verifying transactions is permission. The organizations who run nodes that are doing the verification are called stewards and they enter into a legal agreement with the Sovereign Foundation. And part of that legal agreement is what they can and can't do. And so for example, they can't discriminate based on the content or the uh, person who is offering the transaction. And that, that's how we in, in ensure censorship resistance, even though we have permission consensus. So what he just exemplified there is uh, basically the Sovereign Foundation. Um, the Sovereign Foundation is the, uh, one of the known implementations of Hyperledger Indy. I heard at the talk, uh, at Kiva's talk, that they're planning to run their own uh, implementation of Hyperledger Indy. Um, that's purely based upon speed, and they plan uh, to continue ties and stuff like this um, in the future. We'll see how this goes. But having two independent networks is not necessarily a problem because it comes down to the issuance of the credentials and the issuance of DIDs, uh, which is directly between the verifier and the issuer, or the verifier's trust upon the issuer and the trust of the network and the trust of the framework. And so that's where the sovereign foundation steps in is they bring in those business and those legal aspects to define that strong governance framework on top of the technology. Does that answer that for you? Okay. Um, so yeah, the, the NDSDK is the primary functionality of, uh, in traditional client server architecture, what I like to point out is uh, essentially the client stack. Now that's not 100% true uh, because it's more peer-to-peer -peer based, but uh, it's a good analogy for people to kind of understand what's going on. Uh, so if you're building applications, you typically work on the left side stack. Um, if you're jumping in and helping to contribute to the consensus protocol or the nodes or something like that, then you will be on the right side of the stack. Um, and so that's kind of the thinking behind that. The NDSDK uh, is largely going to be a portion of our demo, um, and this highlights um, you know, what the NDSDK does. Uh, it, it assists with uh, interactions for the ledger, so it acts as a way for me to, to talk to the ledger and talk the protocol of the ledger. Right now, that's dependent upon ZBQ, but like I said, um, we're looking to use agent-to-agent -agent protocol. Um, it comes with a built-in key storage solution called a wallet um, with a standard interface, which is very nice uh, because we actually just landed another implementation. We had an SQLite database in there, and we added a Postgres SQL database. Um, and so that's kind of the, the thinking behind this is depending upon your database needs and the properties of that database, you can actually plug them in with a standard interface. Um, and so that's one of the cool aspects of it. Um, it's also coming built with agent-to-agent -agent protocol features. So this is something I'm specifically working on, uh, which is the agent-to-agent -agent wire message format is what we call it, which is I can basically put in a message, specify who uh, by keys, who I want to send a message to and give my keys and it will package it up, encrypt it for me um, and handle all of these things. This is called the pack functionality. Uh, in the future, we actually want to be able to add functionality where you can just put a did in and it will figure out all the keys for you and these types of things. Um, and so that's kind of the thinking behind it. Uh, additionally, uh, it enables rich identity features for developers, so all of your credential exchange uh, aspects are built into NDSDK. Uh, there's also libvcx, which is now in Hyperledger ND, um, which is an abstraction layer above NDSDK um, to make things a little bit easier for developers. Um, over time, the plan is to actually merge those two libraries together. Uh, additionally, it's written in Rust with C Cobble APIs. 
uh, for easier maintainability. So what that means is all of the logic is written in Rust uh, at a, C, uh, at a, a basic uh, Rust API. They have C callable APIs that then allow for wrappers to call back into it. Um, and so that makes it for easy uh, lockstep uh, interoperability between our wrappers as long as people are maintaining the wrapper that uh, has the interface to the C callable layer. Um, yeah, go ahead. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm not able to hear it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, so currently we support four languages, but uh, we were just talking last night, how can we use things like Swig to actually basically extend to many different wrappers? Um, I've heard of somebody who's working on um, other, uh, an Elixir wrapper as well, which is not possible through Swig based upon what I saw last night. Um, and so, yes, we do plan to extend to it. This makes it even easier um, to be able to do that extensibility. Um, and so that's kind of the thinking behind it. Uh, so does that answer your question? So what languages do you have? What are the four languages? Uh, currently we have, um, uh, we actually just added a Rust a wrapper. So we've got five. We've got Rust, Python, Java, um, .NET, and uh, what's the fifth one? Node.js, yes. Um, and like I was saying, somebody's working on an Elixir wrapper. Um, and so, you know, we're, we're trying to extend that out uh, as much as possible. Um, additionally, you could write it in C. You don't need a wrapper for that, though, because it's C callable. So, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I have a question. Is it possible to use the IDSDK to come up with my own uh, consensus and be able to overcome the problems that I have? It's, it, it doesn't act in that way right now, and that wasn't its intention. Um, in the future, it may be possible if we turn nodes into uh, basically running on agent to agent protocol and stuff like that, but um, there is no current roadmap plans to go that way. Um, so I wouldn't say you know that that'll happen anytime. If you're interested in doing something like that, I would suggest going the plenum route um, and trying to change plenum and plug that into a node. So the next layer is we actually have agents, which are reference implementations, which are consuming, um, they're basically like a bundled pla a package of software uh, that run, uh, you know, ND SDK functionality, but also have UI, UI layers built on top. Um, and so uh, this is built using functionality from ND SDK. It's extensible using this uh, architectural design aspect that we refer to as message families, which are essentially just um, JSON defined uh, data objects that you're moving around. Um, and uh, when you're building your own protocol, what you're defining is a message family and how that message family uh, is built. So if you guys saw Daniel Hardman's talk, that, that's what he was referring to when he was saying uh, basically edge protocols. What he's defining is you define a JSON object and how that JSON is being moved around um, and how it's being signed and leveraging the properties of uh, self-sovereign identity and signature and stuff like that. Um, there's a collection of reference agents to exchange uh, identity information. Uh, this exists out there. I wasn't planning to demo this stuff today because I figured most people hadn't used ND SDK yet, so I wanted to get into ND SDK first. Uh, but once you've gone through the demos today, the idea is you should be able to start looking at these um, ND agents um, and understanding kind of what's happening inside of the agent. Um, and then in the future, be able to develop your own protocols, uh, define that through what we refer to as the indie hype process, um, which is where you're just looking to standardize it. You don't have to standardize these things, uh, but if it's something that's common to many of us, we'd ask that you please do come do that, because that's how we get interoperability. Um, and essentially, when you're defining these, uh, these protocols using the indie SDK, you can extend, extend that functionality. Um, and you should be able to build these and put them in the reference agents, is kind of the thinking. Um, additionally, there's a test suite to establish uh, compatibility with other agents running the agent-to-agent -agent protocol. Um, and essentially what that means is if a protocol has been defined uh, using the hype process, 
um, and you're building your own agent and you want to communicate using that protocol, you can actually test whether or not your protocol is good by communicating against the test suite. The test suite is essentially just a um, very basic agent that gives you a yes or no back whether or not you've communicated the pro protocol properly. Um, and so a part of the hype process, you should be building in tests uh, into the test suite is kind of the thinking. So the last piece, and this is what I assume most people want to get to, um, and it is possible uh, with a little bit of head banging because the protocols aren't, uh, you know, fortuitous at this point. Um, you do have to define your own protocols, but we have identity solutions, which is where I can actually integrate, you know, an agent into a web server and use my phone to remove a password. This is my dream and this is what I'm looking to try and build. I've been trying to get rid of passwords for five years now and that's how I ended up here. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the idea behind this um, is it's an easy way to build Indy into existing applications. We recognize most people aren't going to just throw away their identity solutions and, and start over and re-architect their entire system for this. And so you should be able to build kind of a thin agent uh, or it, so thin agent has a context within our, in our meaning, which means it's, a, it's an agent that has only a single key. So thin agent probably isn't the best word, but you can develop a piece of software that talks agent to agent protocol on your web server so that anybody who talks agent to agent protocol on their phone can use that to log in. Um, so it's extensible, like I said, through creation of message families, allows legacy applications to integrate quickly. And as I said, this is where most people will be building. Our hope is that people start out uh, in the identity um, extensions layer. And over time, some of you will funnel down into the Indy SDK and start developing in Indy SDK and hopefully also developing in Node and Plenum. Um, so that's kind of our hope. Right now, a large dependency similar to uh, what happened with uh, Composer was that it had a dependency on one company um, who was the majority of people developing it and development momentum has severely slowed in Composer because of that. We don't want that to happen, so we're trying as best as possible to get as many communities, uh, as many developers in the community to come in and help contribute to these things. Um, so what that means is, if you guys would like to help contribute, feel free to message me. I will help you get started with these types of things. Um, basically, the only two languages you need to know to develop an SDK is Rust, um, and then on the Node and Plenum side is Python. Um, and so we're starting to get that stuff documented more and more. Uh, but in between, when documentation is, you know, perfect, although we all know it's never going to be perfect. Um, and, and now, basically, you can ask me questions and I'll help you get the information that's necessary. So that is the entire architecture of everything which allows you to have self-sovereign identity. So next we will move on to the demo use cases. Um, these are just kind of slides. Uh, they're talking about hyperledgerity. I've covered this just through talks, but uh, because I like to share the slides as well afterwards, or if you guys want to go back and look, you can take a look and uh, refresh your memory as to what I said. Can I ask a quick question before you move on? Yeah. Um, so what, what would be the most mainstream SDK to use? Uh, Which language? Right now, I found Python to be the most effective. Um, Node.js is a very close second. Um, they are the ones that are being used the most and that's the ones that we have reference implementations built. Um, as a part of what I'm working on in this demo is to actually get all of those wrappers up uh, to speed um, to write the how-to guides in every single language and then to also build all of those wrappers into the CI CD pipeline so that we can run the tests and the how-tos to make sure they're running every single time. One of the problems that we've had uh, is that the how-to guides get outdated as we update things within the NDS SDK, um, and because they get outdated, um, the how-tos break and people have had a hard time getting onboarded. Um, so that's kind of the thinking behind that, but it's a side project for me in many ways. Um, so I just do that in my free time to try and help people um, understand Indy a little bit faster. Yeah, go ahead. Um, it's possible, but I couldn't say. <laughs> um, I know people have gotten Corda and Indy hooked up together. Um, I've heard rumblings that somebody may have figured out Fabric and Indy together. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, um, if you go look at Corda, it's 
Port Entity, which is um, hyperledger ending integrated with Corda. I believe Corda is based on Fabric. Luxoft is the company that did that integration. There's another one too that I'm not familiar with. But anyway, the, the, there, there's people working on this and progress is being made. One of the key uh, things that people are interested in is how can I use a hyperledger in the based identity in a smart contract. Yep. So that's what some of my colleagues uh, who are doing research are, are working on, and, and that's really kind of what my day job is focused on, is how do I take Indy and go show how it connects to others to create additional value in other blockchain projects? Um, that's kind of, you know, the idea behind interoperability. The second component of that is how do we take self-sovereign identity from Indy and leverage it to communicate with other self-sovereign identity projects like Uport um, and like uh, BTCR and, and uh, the likes of ERC-725 and there's basically a giant community of these different things. Um, so yeah, this is specifying the uh, collaboration tools um, that you can use and kind of the, the important aspects. Most discussion happens on Rocket Chat, but a lot of the thicker architectural discussions happen on the uh, indie mailing list. Uh, so I'd suggest uh, checking in there. Um, when you have questions, most often Indie SDK is the best uh, Rocket Chat channel for you. Um, here is contributing to code. So like I said, we'd love to see more developers showing up and helping to contribute. Um, and uh, here's kind of the, the highlight slides. These are, most of this stuff I borrowed from Tracy, uh, so it was easier to just throw this stuff in. Um, uh, but it, it highlights the, the larger points. We're looking for people to help come contribute. Uh, this is also a good, a good thing to check out. It's somewhat... Um, outdated, we try to keep it as up to date as possible, but most of our documentation is starting to move over to a read the doc style, similar to what Fabric has. And so because of that, uh, the wiki page has been somewhat neglected, but it also has good links to good information. So I wanted to include that in here for people who are looking for it. Um, Additionally, we've got the read the docs. Um, right now, the, the hype for this uh, standardization process for standardizing how we do documentation in Indy just went through yesterday. Um, so this stuff is going to start to be merged into it. So what that means is all the documentation that's written in Markdown inside of the each individual repositories are viewable in an HTML format um, using read the docs and stuff like that. We also have a few working groups. Here's a link to that. Um, so this is Thursday at the uh, convenient time of your time zone. Um, hopefully convenient. You obviously can't hit all 24 hours, but we tried to uh, adjust it to, to hit the majority of who is in the Indy community, which is uh, typically people in the US and Europe. Um, and then additionally, we shifted, which uh, was on Fridays at 8 a.m., we shifted the agents working groups so that we can now uh, cover Europe, um, the U.S., and then also uh, one guy in New Zealand um, has been showing up um, who's been helping contribute a lot to the routing protocol and stuff like that. So, um, you know, we're... we're Probably not going to shift this again, so if it's inconvenient, I apologize. Please message me. Uh, I'm on Rocket Chat quite a bit. Um, I work outside of traditional US time zone hours quite a bit, um, so I'm up at like 3 a.m. usually. Um, that's just how I sleep. <laughs> um, additionally, we have the hype process. Um, uh, which is basically defining a lot of the documentation um, around uh, standardization, so agent-to-agent -agent protocol stuff, uh, different other protocols, as well as any changes we're making that are significant to the plenum consensus, to the node repository, or to the Indie SDK, are supposed to go through a request uh, for comments uh, process style. Um, and so that's the thinking of the Indie Hypes. It's a great place to find documentation about how things are done. Um, if you can't find it in docs, um, this is probably the secondary place that I recommend, as well as going forward, this is going to become kind of a gold mine of documents as we are standardizing stuff. The last thing is the links to the uh, Rocket Chat and the mailing list. This is the high level ND1. Uh, feel free to come into any channel that has ND in it. Um, we'll direct you to the right place and we'll get your questions answered. Um, so that's kind of the thinking behind that. So, now we're to the cool part that most people came for, the demos. Um, 
I just wanted to give a high level first. Uh, so the intent of this talk was uh, to go kind of a business transition into a developer transition. Um, and so this gives a high level uh, demo of what um, Hyperledger Indie can do using the user interface. So we will hope that we have sound. If not, I will just narrate. Um, yeah, I'm not seeing sound. Uh, that's fine. So essentially what this is, is this is a demo which was built by IBM to show uh, going through the getting started process, which we're actually going to go take a deeper dive down and look at the code as well, um, which is taking a look at uh, first registering an individual. Um, so they're talking, um, and essentially what this is, is this is our getting started guide. Uh, it's just in a UI format uh, that is understandable to a mainstream audience. Like I said, the presentations and the high level coverage is supposed to do business stuff, and then demo gets deeper and deeper into the weeds. So if, you, if I go too deep at some point, feel free to get up and walk away or ask questions. I'd love to have you stay, but who knows? Um, so the idea behind this is essentially we've got a government ID uh, that's being requested. So I've already been issued an ID. The government already has uh, you know, access to this data, which is where this demo doesn't match production level quality. Typically, I don't tell uh, you know, the government my address is 123 Fake Street. Um, and so uh, they would already have that data and they can issue it directly to me and I could just make a request for that data. Uh, but in this case, um, the easiest way to build that demo was to actually do this. So what we're seeing here is actually an, uh, an agent in a way. Uh, so it stores credentials for us. It has a wallet and it's built into um, a web server um, so that you can actually access it. Uh, so in that process, what you saw there was they were basically getting a, a government ID right then. Um, and so now what we're taking a look at is we're actually going to try and get issued a credential by um, Faber College. Um, and so what we're doing here is we're uh, taking a look at the proofs that we already have. Uh, so this is like literally the actual JSON data that's being moved during credentials uh, and uh, the encoding process of these types of things. Um, and we're going to take some of that data that already exists in here um, and we're going to actually be able to uh, request another credential um, based upon these types of things and fill these types of uh, this information in directly into the agent. So that was one of the features of this agent is that it can actually look at the credentials I've already got and fill in the Alice, uh, the first name and the last name um, to be able to actually then provide uh, the other information afterwards. So they're now providing their social security number, uh, degree, and year graduated and stuff like this. So they're getting now a transcript from their college for that. Additionally, the college would likely already have this data, so you wouldn't be providing it to them so that they can then provide it back to you. Um, but in the process of this demo, uh, this was built I believe about six months ago, um, when the idea of agents and standardized agent-to-agent -agent protocols and stuff like this and what they would look like wasn't as well defined. Um, and so that's kind of the, why they went into this process. Um, additionally, now that we've got a transcript and we've also got um, our government ID, what we can do is we can now go apply for a job. Um, and with those credentials, I can prove to them, similarly to what I have to do when I go apply for a job today, other than the fact that I just write it on my resume and when they find out you know, if I, if I fake my um, degree or something, then they fire me. Now they can actually have proof that I received the, the transcript from my, my actual college because they will be able to verify the issuer of that transcript. Um, and so that's kind of the thinking behind this is I can now take that transcript and go over to my employer and prove I actually have a degree. Um, and then I can get a job with that. Now moving on, what we're gonna do is after we've completed the job application, we're now gonna get what we refer to as an employee uh, certification of being an employee. This is very valuable when you're trying to prove that you have a job to go apply for the loan, which is what the use case is here. Um, and so in this case, uh, Alice gets to set her own salary and she chose $200,000. Um, not likely. Uh, we all wish though. <laughs> um, 
Lastly, though, what we're going to do is we're going to then go apply for a loan at the bank. Um, and with this, what you'll see here is she's got all the information, so she doesn't even have to type in any inf information anymore. She can just automatically submit it because what they're doing is they're now requesting proof of credentials. Um, when you're typing in information, that's what we refer to as a self-attested credential. You're basically, it's not issued by anybody else, you're just stating that's what it is, and there's no way for them to verify it. However, in the case of the, the bank loan, uh, they want all that information to be verified by somebody else so they can actually uh, request all of that from the, uh, from the actual issuers. Um, and you can choose to share that data with them, is the thinking behind it. So in this uh, case, this agent now has five credentials and was able to just be able to uh, go through the loan approval process that quickly. Now, we all know that's not how quickly a loan approval process is, but it does exemplify one of the key points of what this can do. It can enable much faster uh, transfer of data in a trusted way. Um, and that's a very important aspect uh, to consider as we look forward. So now we are at the interactive point. Uh, and I can't jump forward. There we go. Uh, oh, sorry. This is a link to uh, their demo that they built. It's built around a deprecated getting started guide. Uh, that getting started guide ran through the uh, Indie node. Um, so I wouldn't recommend using this. I'd recommend using the getting started guide that's in the Indie SDK, uh, which I have built into the uh, demo here. Um, however, it is a good example. Um, and I do want to give credit because they went and built this code. So I wanted to show you guys. If you want to go take a look, um, see what an example agent might look like. Um, that's a good thing to check, take a look at. Next, we have uh, basically a uh, agent that has been built by Stephen Curran. Um, he is one of the uh, Hyperledger Indie Ambassadors as well, um, and he's also on the Sovereign Technical Governance Board. Um, and so that's uh, Indie is oftentimes tied with Sovereign uh, because we're one of the largest implementations. Uh, before I found out about Kiva, we were the only implementation that I knew of um, running Hyperledger Indie. Uh, we are also the primary contributors of code to it. Um, and so he has strong association to that. You've probably seen some of his demos. He was given a demo this morning. Um, as well as he gave a talk yesterday um, where he was actually talking about uh, his project that he worked on, um, which is BC Gov's um, org book, which is running an agent in it as well. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna actually do a live demo here um, that showcases uh, his education um, agents that are actually communicating together. Um, so now to go ahead and do this, let me jump ahead in my slides to show you kind of where you will want to be. Um, you're going to want to click this link uh, for people who are going to want to follow along. Um, and this will actually give you a link uh, to a document of how you follow along um, with this. This is also very nice if you want to come back later on or if you're uh, going back to work and trying to figure these things out or something like that, you can uh, follow this self-started guide uh, to be able to actually take a look and, and go through these links. So um, if I click this link here, it's the same link that I had before. Um, and what we're going to actually do is we're going to leverage uh, this cool new thing I found out about through uh, Steven and his demo, which is called um, um, Play with Docker. Play with Docker is essentially a Dockerized instance that runs in a browser. Um, and so the only thing you need to, to follow along with these demos uh, should be to operate using a web browser inside of this. You can actually clone repositories directly into it. Um, and to get access to this, you need a um, Docker uh, Docker Hub login, um, and so it seems like mine's already been cached, uh, which is why mine says start, but typically it'll come up with the login button and you just enter your credentials for Docker. Uh, all of this is hosted by Docker itself. It seems like a marketing uh, aspect, but four hours of free Docker and a web browser, I might as well use it, so. <laughs> um, so we're gonna go ahead and uh, connect to it here. So the way that you use this, uh, we're just going to add an instance. Um, and so that's what uh, this document here is uh, walking you through. Um, when you click into it, there is, we're going to jump into that document here. I believe it's this link right here. No. So that's telling you how to set up Docker, it looks like. I'm trying to find the right link. 
this one. Um, and so this is going through uh, basically how you actually run this demo. Um, so the first thing that I want to do is I want to actually go back and clone this repository into here. So I have to jump into the education to get that link. Um, we're going to use HTTPS. Um, it's already got git installed in it, so we're just going to git clone this stuff. And then we will go into the education repository, um, LFS171X. So what this is, is this is the Coursera um, uh, course that Hyperledger is uh, working on, which is actually able to uh, show you how to get started with all of the projects. Uh, I know uh, we've got Andy in there. I've seen uh, Sawtooth. I'm not sure if it's still being worked on. Uh, I believe Fabric's already in there as well. Um, so it's a cool repository to check out if you're trying to figure out what's, what's going on um, with these different projects. Yeah, so here's a list of them. So we've got Composer as well uh, as another one. So we're going to go into the ending material. Can everybody see this as well? Can you guys see this in the back? Oh, that's a bit odd. Um, the colors uh, for what? Oh, okay. That doesn't look like it. That's key bindings. Let's see if I can do that. That didn't help. Keep the settings open. <laughs> hmm. By the way, you are aware of the coffee break now? I am not. If we are at coffee break, let's take a break before I head into this demo further, and I will try and debug this as you guys are given a coffee break. Also, it's not like you guys are trapped in this room. Feel free to come and go as you go. Um, do you know when the coffee break ends? I think it's almost an hour. An hour? Okay. Um, yeah, go, go for the coffee break. Uh, I just wanted to figure out what time it was that I uh, should start back up so that everybody knew. From the 3.50 to 4.40? 3.50 to 4.40? Okay, so we will start at 4.45 to give people about five minutes to get back in here. So, and it is 3.56, so a little bit over the coffee break. <laughs> 